Ms. Alexander, tell us briefly, what, what do you do? What's your well, main occupation? At the moment, I'm the director of a uh, research unit in the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Cape Town. Um, it's called the Project for the Study of Alternative Education in South Africa. Mm, the name is historical, because, but um, at the moment we focus very largely on language planning, language policy and education, and literacy development, especially early literacy development. Okay. In addition to that, because of work that we are doing on the African continent, very extensive work, um, we are involved in translating many, many texts uh, into African languages. So how does the translation project relate to the education, mother tongue education? Um, our project has become part of a network of African institutions across the whole continent which are involved in six or seven core projects of the African Academy of Languages. One of these is a project called the Stories Across Africa project and our project in Cape Town is actually the coordinator continentally of that particular project. It involves among other things establishing a culture of reading in African languages. So in order to get to that point, you have to do a whole lot of things apart from advocacy and so on. Mm -hmm. You've also got to translate. So we translate, uh, one of the things we're doing at the moment, amongst many others, is to translate African stories, a few also from outside of Africa, but mainly African stories, into many different African languages so that the same texts can be written in, uh, read rather, in different languages by the children of Africa, as it were. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it's, it's linked to literacy learning, obviously. It's linked to bilingual education, which is one of our big things. It's uh, multi, um, what we call mother tongue-based bilingual education, which involves simply maintaining the mother tongue as a language of teaching, the meaning of instruction, mm -hmm. for as long as possible, as long as the resources, human and material, permit, and gradually phasing in usually the language of wider communication, which in most cases is either English or French, and in, in uh, some countries, of course, uh, Portuguese. So we call it mother tongue-based binding education. And these, all these projects are very closely in, mm -hmm. you know, linked to one another. Does the education project <coughs> require translations into African, language. African languages for educational purposes, for education. textbooks and things like that. Yes, yes. And, and, and terminology development. Okay, so you're also developing languages. We're developing uh, corp, corp, corpus, uh, corpora, um, uh, specifically for science and mathematics mm -hmm. in African languages. Of course, we ourselves are uh, operate mainly with South African languages, uh, more specifically with Isiklosa, which is the local uh, African language in the Western Cape, but other colleagues in different parts of the continent are working in many different other African mm -hmm. languages. We work very closely with the Institute, Institute for Kiswahili Research in Dar es Salaam, where of course there are streets ahead of what we do. Okay. <coughs> yeah, so, so then I'm also, by the way, a, a professor extraordinaire at the University of Stellenbosch, where we are now. Um, and uh, uh, my specific brief is language planning. And I teach a language planning module to students, postgraduate students, we call it the honors degree. And it's one of the things I enjoy doing most. Okay. One of the things that fascinates me here is that it's impossible to study translation by itself. It, it seems to be very much embedded in the whole issue of language planning, uh, mother tongue education, uh, a whole policy. Uh, yeah. Is it wrong, do you think, in the African context to focus exclusively on translation? Well, let me put it this way, I actually don't think it's possible. Okay. So the question of whether it's wrong okay. doesn't matter. <laughs> <Right. coughs> <coughs> One of the things that we've recognized, certainly the language planning community, but even uh, the, the pedagogues, have recognized that <coughs> In order to develop African languages for use 
in domains other than the primary domains of the family, the community, the church, and so on, in secondary but obviously more high-powered domains, like tertiary education, like uh, teaching science and, and uh, mathematics, uh, or um, you know teaching philosophy and so on. In order to do that, you've got to translate from other languages into African languages, also other African languages. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of material, for example, in uh, Kiswahili, obviously in Arabic, and uh, in uh, languages like Hausa and so on, which need to be translated into other African languages. But most of, at the moment certainly, most of the translation is from European languages into African languages. Now that is something that you just cannot avoid. And at the University of Cape Town, although ours is the main uh, project that's involved in this uh, in this particular area, there are a number of others where <coughs> glossaries of terms are being developed in different South African languages, indigenous languages, in order to facilitate the learning at tertiary level, for example, of civil engineering or medicine mm -hmm. or anthropology and so on, uh, for students who are not first language speakers of English. So these glossaries are developed in order to help them to understand. And, they, and they're not, you know, one sort of one-to-one -one, uh, type, uh, dictionary type uh, uh, glossaries. They, they are really what glossaries mean. That they explain the term, give uh, a particular uh, uh, variant in the indigenous language, sometimes more than one, and it's explained in that language and so on. Okay. And that's the nature of many of our dictionaries, actually. You made the point, I think, that that was done for Afrikaans. In its, in, its day. in its day, yes. so it should be possible for other languages. Absolutely. Afrikaans, of course, had the advantage quite apart now from issues of dominance and uh, power and wealth and so on. It had the advantage that it could uh, call on the resources of Dutch. Yes. Because it's such a cognate language. Okay. I'm interested in yourself. Uh, what were you doing when you were 22, 23, 24? If I may ask. Yes, certainly, <laughs> certainly. I was at the University of Cape Town. <clears throat> I started there in '53 when I was only 16 years old, and finished my uh, BA when I was 19 with majors in German language, uh, philology, mm -hmm. and history. And because we were very poor, uh, and you know, university education was a major privilege, I was dependent on bursaries. And as luck would have it. The better bursary, as it were, was for German, mm -hmm. continuing my German studies. Quite apart from the fact that I was obviously genuinely interested in German uh, language studies. So, at the age of 20, up to about 24, uh, I was f first of all at the University of Cape Town. I did my, uh, ma my honors as my master's in German philology, then got a major uh, scholarship, fellowship actually to the University of Tübingen in Germany, where I completed my doctorate in German uh, 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 language and literature in 1961. Mm. And that is actually where my interest in studying language, not so much linguistics, mm. more the, what was then correctly called philology, uh, studying language uh, arose. In particular, the study of uh, Luther's translation of the Bible mm -hmm. into German, as well as the subsequent developments uh, which led to the creation of Standard German and so on, those things interested me very, very much. And then, of course, I did quite a lot of dialectology uh, in the sense that the, the particular focus of my doctoral thesis was Gerhard Hauptmann, mm -hmm. a German dramatist mm -hmm. of the late 19th century who wrote some of his earlier works in the Silesian dialect. And I had studied for my uh, masters, I had studied Silesian Baroque drama. <laughs> Very abstruse subject, but massively interesting because of the Thirty Years' War, mm, which was the, yes, the basis of it all, and the contradictions, the, the polarities of that time and of that society. And all these things interest me. And then, of course, as I say, <clears throat> the fact that he wrote in the Silesian dialect made me look at the whole dialect spectrum in Germany and I became very interested in the language side even though my own uh, my own uh, focus of study was literature. Mm. 
So it wasn't. Uh, I eventually ended up in prison because of anti-apartheid activity. In where? In on Robben Island. When was this? Uh, in '63. So you returned from Germany in '61, middle of '61. Then I taught for two years at a high school where I taught German and history, yeah. as well as the University of Cape Town where I taught German, and um, but on a part-time basis. And then in '63 I was arrested. Uh, 64, I was sentenced to 10 years, spent 10 years on Robben Island. You spent 10 years? Yeah. This is where Nelson Mandela is there. No, we were in the same uh, section actually, okay. I know him very well, got to know each other well. We were in different political uh, tendencies and organizations. Mine was a very small left-wing uh, group uh, and I was very critical of some of the more, what I thought at the time, <laughs> were sort of compromising stances. Yes of the ANC. But anyhow, as a result of that experience, it became very, very clear to me that the language issue is one of the central issues for the future of South Africa, more specifically around the question of how do you bring about social cohesion, how do you bring about a sense of national unity. It's easy to be part of a nation in a juridical sense, you have a passport, you have an ID, etc. But to feel committed to the people of the country, to the nation, so to speak, obviously requires many other uh, processes, economic, social, cultural, and my area was cultural. So for me it was very important to, under to get to the understanding, which I did eventually, that if our children could learn two or three local languages and communicate effortlessly with one another, that in that sense we would be building bridges, mm -hmm. intercultural communication, yes. that would make social cohesion, sense of national unity much more possible and that could act as an obstruction to anything like the Rwanda type genocide. Yes. You know? so, so it was from that angle, more sort of cultural political angle, that I then eventually, when I was outside, and that's a long story there, uh, after serving five years of house arrest, um, this is in addition to the uh, ten yeah, years. Yeah, the ten years. Uh, I mean, apartheid was tough. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so after that, that I eventually decided to focus on language planning as a discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, started that in uh, South Africa itself already in the early 80s. In 1990, I got a research uh, fellowship to Yale University, and my focus was language planning. Joshua Fishman. I met Joshua yes, Fishman yes. at uh, Palo Alto, okay. California, as well as in New York, <clears throat> and so on. I got to know him very well. I'm still in touch with mm -hmm. him, and so on. So, so you know, um, uh, it was it was all those things coming together that made me decide on language planning as a career choice, so to speak. You, you, you see, you're radically against then the European Schleiermacherian idea of one language, one nation. I don't believe it works in anywhere outside of Western Europe. Good. Yes. I think that uh, all the or even in within Western Europe, right? even with nowadays, come from Spain. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, we have nowadays even within, yeah, yes, quite. Yes. Nowadays even within other uh, West European countries, never mind Spain. Yes. You know, because there's so much migration taking place, yes. it's impossible to speak of any monolingual uh, yes. country. Quite apart from the fact that some of these countries became monolingual by force. <laughs> You know, if you think of France and how they suppress the uh, different languages, yes, yes, you know. Yes. So um, the the from the creation by uh, colonial conquest of states, modern states, for example, on the African continent, Asia, and so on, was obviously not just artificial. I don't necessarily believe that any state is artificial. I mean, all states are artificial in some sense, but uh, artificial in the language sense that you know, language. Um, uh, continua was simply broken up and so on, um, meant that you had people speaking many different varieties, sometimes mutually unintelligible, in one so-called state. And this meant that a monolingual solution to the national question, to national unity and so on, is not possible. Yes. Nowhere in Africa. So, perforce in a sense we had to arrive at a theory of a multilingual nation. Mm -hmm. And in other words, multilingualism is the real answer to the question of national unity. Okay. Can I ask you finally, uh, for people doing translation research, what sort of questions should we be investigating? What are the problems to be solved? Today, I would say be, uh, because of technological developments, 
translation, interpreting and so on, have all become in one sense very easy, much easier. I think can happen much faster, they can happen in much more detail and so on. However, I think that the cultural political issues need to be much more carefully studied. And I, I thought that this morning's session, uh, the two uh, talks, uh, although they were very different in their uh, approaches, complemented uh, each other quite well in that sense that they both pointed to the need, first of all, to consider the target audience of any translation effort very much more carefully, to consider what is actually required, firstly. Secondly, uh, to consider the context of translation uh, much more accurately. And in that regard, I think the, the creation, uh, the coming into being of the African Academy of Languages in some ways is a serendipitous moment for Africa because you've got a group of relatively young people, uh, most of them highly trained linguists, who are very committed to the promotion of African languages, but not in some romantic, wild sense. They've got a very clear idea of priorities, starting with uh, what they call vehicle across border languages focusing on developing those, at the same time, of course, developing the larger languages, which are not necessarily cross-border, and so on. In other words, they are studying the needs, as it were, of the populations that have to be served by these languages very carefully. They are very clear about the contextual issues, about the cultural issues. In my view, one of the most important things for Africa is the issue that I've raised, not the first one, the, but certainly the one who's tried to go furthest with that, namely, how do you, via translation, establish the continuity between tradition and modernity? I think it's one of the most important, the most significant things that we in Africa can, as it were, develop and uh, uh, bring to the attention of, you know, the world community. That through the fact that language is charged with tradition in its overtones, its meanings and so on, through that fact it is possible for people to appropriate modernity in all the different uh, facets of it, to appropriate modernity in such a way that it no longer towers above them as some alien force. It's something that they can control, as it were, and about which they can become much more creative because it's there in their own language. Professor Alexander, thank you very much. Thank you very much.